Over the past few weeks, we've been in this series called Blueprint, and in this series, we're asking the question, what is the point of the church? What is the point of all this? What are we doing here? Uh, and this is such a basic question, right? I mean, it's such a basic question, but it's so basic, I think, that we often overlook it or forget to ask it. And because we overlook it and because it's so forgotten, I think it's easy for us to end up in different places on this question. In fact, I actually think that's probably the normal human thing for us to actually get this question wrong because it's so easy for us to drift from this. And so it's always healthy for us as a church to revisit this question. What's the point? Why are we here? Especially whenever you have a new pastor and a new congregation getting to know each other. And now as a church staff, as a church LBA, the church leadership, this is something we should revisit every month, every week in our planning, every day in our prayers. This is something that's that important, it's that crucial, it's that foundational for us. Because, I mean, what's the point of all of this? If we miss the point of all of this. You follow me? And so we've got to get this question right. And so what, I've been, what we've been reminded of in this series is that the point of the church is this, and that is that our mission, the one and only thing that Jesus asked us to do and accomplish as a church is to seek and to save the lost. And we see this all throughout the New Testament, that Jesus lays down this principle for us that's incredibly simple, right? But it's also controversial sometimes because it's not always easy for us in the church to hear this or to accept it. But the principle is this, and that is that when something is lost, it takes priority over something that's found. When something is lost, it takes priority over what is found. And we especially see this in Luke chapter 15. Jesus shares three parables in a row. He shares the parable about the lost sheep, and it shows Jesus leaving the 99 to go pursue the lost sheep. The next parable he shares about the lost coin where this lady, she loses a valuable coin and so she tears the house apart looking for this thing. When she finds it, she throws a party because she's so excited that she found it. Then the third parable is the parable of the lost son. We usually call this the, the prodigal son story, right? Where the son is lost. But whether, whether if it's a, a lost sheep or a lost coin or a lost person, what we see is this principle working it out. That when something is lost, you drop everything to find it. And so Jesus talks about this idea in several other places in the New Testament as well. I mean, several places. We'll just mention one this morning. But in Matthew 9, Jesus is in this debate with the religious leaders of his day in the city. And they're having this back and forth. And, it, and this is where we start here in Matthew 9. He says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and they ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so Jesus makes it quite clear in the Bible all throughout the New Testament what the point of the church is going to be from the blueprint of his ministry. And that's to embrace and carry on his mission to seek and to save the lost. There's a great old quote that probably you guys have heard of um, that really captures the essence of what Jesus is saying here. And, it, and it's that the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for the saints. Have any of you heard that? Yeah, I've heard that from several of you so far in this series, but the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for the saints. A hospital's purpose is to bring healing, is to bring health to people so they can enjoy a better future, right? And a museum's purpose is to preserve things in the past. Right before Jesus left this earth to go back to heaven, He's with his disciples and he's about to go. And he gave this command to all of his followers that were gathered there. And he said to go, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey 
everything that I have commanded you. Now, we Christians, we call this the Great Commission, right? This is because this is where Jesus commissions his church. He gives us our marching orders on what it is that we're supposed to do. And so if we're asking this question, what's the point of the church? From Jesus' words in these scriptures and throughout the New Testament, our takeaway is this. It's that the church exists for those who are not yet a part of her. That's why we're here. And we've symbolized this by this empty chair. And this chair symbolizes for us the people who are not here yet. They're still unreached. They're still unchurched. They're not here yet. They don't know Jesus personally. They don't have a church home. They don't have a church family like we enjoy. And we found out that there are 30,000 people just in our little zip code here, 28213. 30,000 people who remain unreached. They don't have a church home. They don't know Jesus. That's 80% of the people in this area remain unreached. That statistic ought to break our hearts. Our mission field is not overseas somewhere. It's in our backyard. So let me ask you a question. How did you come to faith in Jesus. Just think about it for a minute. Think about your story. Think about your testimony. How did you come to faith in Jesus? How, who, who was it that, that influenced you to become a Christian? Now, I don't know all of your stories yet. I've heard some of them. But I know this, that whatever your story is, whatever the testimony is, there is someone who is responsible for bringing you to Jesus. There was a person that helped you come to Jesus. They're responsible for that decision. So who is that for you? Think about it. Who is it? Who is responsible for you coming to Jesus? Maybe who's responsible for you coming to this church? Think about that. For me, it's my dad. My dad prayed with me when I was seven years old. And um, I just came to him that God had been dealing with my heart, and I said, Dad, I want, I want to know that Jesus is in my heart. And so he prayed with me, and, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and I made the decision to follow him. And uh, for my dad, it was, it was a whole different thing altogether. It was a TV evangelist for him, which, you know, TV evangelists have gotten a lot of knocks over the years, right? And deservedly so, because there have been some crooked ones. But there's also been some good ones. And um, my dad was an Air Force guy, and he was, he was uh, stationed in Alaska, of all places, He's at the edge of the world, right? Might as well be in Alaska. But when dad tells his story, he'll tell you that he wanted to be up there in Alaska because he could do anything he wanted to up there. There was very little accountability. And so he could do whatever. He was drinking. He was doing drugs. Overall, just living this wild lifestyle. But one particular night, he comes back to his room. He'd been out at the bars drinking, so he comes back. He's drunk and he comes in the, his room, he turns on the TV and just kind of collapses on the bed and he starts watching the TV. And there's this TV evangelist on the TV and he's preaching. And in Alaska, on the edge of the world, in this little military barracks room, and my dad being completely intoxicated, God's presence came. And he captured his heart. And dad gave his heart to the Lord that day. He called, he called the little number at the bottom of the screen and talked to the prayer counselor on the phone. And the prayer counselor walked him through a prayer. And he received the Lord into his life. And everything has been different since that night. God completely transformed him completely transformed and delivered him from his alcoholism and he completely transformed the life of our family as a result of all that. And so when you look at dad's life, you can see though how God used various people to bring him to Jesus. He used the TV evangelist as he's you know, preaching and, and, and trying to be faithful in what he's doing in his TV show. Uh, God uses that prayer counselor that he calls on the phone to talk my dad through that and to lead him in a prayer. God used my mom and my grandmother who was praying for him, other friends who were praying for him. 
to see him come to Jesus. And if you're following Jesus today, someone is responsible for bringing you to Jesus too. Who is it? Is there one person that you can point to or is it several? But there's people involved. I had a great conversation with Linda McKnight this week and she told me a little bit about her story, about how she came to Jesus and also how she came to United. It's a great story. How God brought her here and her kids and her family here, all of that. But we need to share these stories with each other. We need to hear them from each other. And so I want to invite you to come this Wednesday night. I know this is a little outside the box here, a little different. I want to invite you to come this Wednesday <clears throat> between 6 and 6.30. I'll have a little, a little camera set up. And I'd love for you to share your story in 20 seconds. Who was responsible for bringing you to Jesus? And I just want to capture as many of our stories as we can. And so we can show this in a couple of weeks here in the service, and we'll all get to hear from each other how Jesus captured our hearts and who did he use to bring him, to bring us to him. Would you guys be up for that? Seriously, this Wednesday, seriously, I'm going to have everything set up in, a, in what was the kid's office, and we'll just come, come ready to answer the question, who is responsible for bringing you to Jesus? 20-second answer, guys, Okay. We don't need your life story, just 20 seconds, okay? Just tell us who and how it happened very quickly because if we have 15 or 20 of you come, that's, that video is going to get very long in a hurry, okay? But seriously, I'd love for you to do that. If you can't come Wednesday, come some other day. I'll meet you here. It's not, it's not hard. You can even take it, do a selfie video and take it and, and, let, and send it to me, okay? We can capture these in all kinds of ways, but we need to hear these stories from each other. You guys up for that? Maybe. All right, all right, I know, I know. So I'm asking you to do something kind of weird. Put yourself out there. Nobody loves a camera. I get it, I get it. That's okay. We'll edit it. We'll make you look real good, okay? So don't you worry. Don't you worry about that. But the reason it's important for us to hear these stories from each other is because we used to be the empty chair. We were this person. This was us. And then someone reached out to us. Someone prayed for us. And now you're here. So who was it that was responsible for bringing you here? Man, aren't you glad someone influenced you to bring you to Jesus? And now... It's our turn. It's our turn. Who is it that's waiting on us to pray for them? Who is it that's waiting on us to reach out to them to come? Who is it that's waiting on us to tell them about the love and the joy and the purpose that Jesus brings in our life? Who is it? That's what this empty chair is all about. And so this church, this gathering of people that's here this morning, exists to reach those who are not here yet. I've claimed one of these empty chairs for myself, and I'm praying, Lord, who is it that you're, that you're leading me to, to reach out to? Who is it? Who's that person? Lead me to that person to share your love with, to invite to be a part of your church. Many of you are praying as well. So keep praying, keep praying. This is the point. This is the point of the church that we've been talking about. It's our one and only mission that Jesus commanded us to accomplish. So we've, we've been in this blueprint series, right? And so a blueprint is this design. It's a model. It's a plan. It's something that you use to build something from. And so when you build a home, you build it by using a blueprint, right? All of the contractors, the plumbers, the electricians, the sheetrock guys, the painting, painters, man, we just went through a renovation in our house and I just have a whole new level of appreciation for these guys that know what they're doing. And, uh, but all of these guys operate from the same blueprint in order to build a house. And when they don't, you run into trouble in a hurry. I can tell you that. Well, Jesus lays out a blueprint in the Bible for what the church is supposed to be and what the church is supposed to do too. And so just like when we're building a home, when we don't follow the blueprint for the church, we're going to run into trouble too. 
right? And so in his blueprint for the church, Jesus lays out five purposes of the church. Or here's a better way to think about it or an easier way to think about it. It's five things that God wants us to do as a church to accomplish the one thing, right? So the one thing is our mission. This is what we're supposed to accomplish. This is what we're supposed to do is our mission is to reach to seek and to save the lost, right? But there's five ways that we do it. There's five things that we do in order to do that one thing. Does that make sense? And so he gives us these five things. This is our blueprint that we're following. These five purposes that we must prioritize if we're going to reach those 30,000 people, the 30,000 men, women, and children all around this church that don't know Jesus. We've looked at a couple of these purposes so far. Uh, the first one that we looked at a couple weeks ago was outreach. This is intentionally reaching out to other people around us with the love of Jesus. And so this is one of those things that has to happen if we're going to reach those 30,000, if we're going to reach the unreached. Last week we talked about discipleship. This is another purpose that we talked about. And we defined it as becoming more like Jesus. Discipleship is when our lives begin to begin to be more and more like Jesus, when we begin to think like Jesus thinks, when we begin to feel like he feels, we see what he sees, and we begin to say what he would say. And that has to happen too, if we're going to reach the unreached around us. Have you ever wondered why the Bible talks about all of these sinners and tax collectors and all of these outcasts, why they were drawn to Jesus? And yet today in our culture, people are not drawn to the church in the same way, if any at all. Sometimes our churches repel people. Well, I think it's because we're not quite like him yet. Doesn't that make sense? This is a discipleship problem for us. It's not just an outreach problem. Because the more we become like Jesus, the more people in our community, they'll be attracted to us. They'll enjoy being around us. They'll want to be here. Because probably one of the things that defined Jesus more than anything else was love. People knew that he cared. He gave a rip about their life and about their future. He accepted people as they were, but then he offered them hope of a different future that they could change, that they had a purpose to fulfill in this life. Man, people are looking for that. They're looking for acceptance, for someone to care and that to love, for, love them. They're looking for something bigger than themselves to live for. And so the more that we are like Jesus in the way we talk, in the way we live, in the way that we think, the more we become like him, the more we will have those opportunities to share his love with them too. And so that's got to happen too. Outreach has to happen. Discipleship has to happen. And so we want to continue studying the blueprint this morning by looking at the third thing that Jesus lays out in the Bible, the thing that we have to do to reach the people around us. But before we can dive into that third purpose, there's something else I want us to kind of talk about um, that's another kind of area of confusion about the church. And I think it'll be good for us to talk about really quickly. Today's culture, we, when we think of a church, we typically think of, something different than what the Bible says about what the church is. The, the word church meant something different back then. And back in those days, 2,000 years ago, in the time of the, the New Testament, the church meant it was a gathering of people. It was, they were called out from their homes into a public place. It was an assembly, a gathering of, of people. It was actually a secular term. It was more like a political term, actually. Back in those days, if, if a village needed to decide something, maybe there was a problem that they were trying to, that they needed to be fixed, then the people would be called out from their homes, the men, into an open public area to gather together where the matter could be discussed and they could figure out what to do and they would even vote on whatever the, the you know, solution was going to be. And that was called an ecclesia, that was the Greek word for that, but that's, that's the word church. And so it was actually a secular word that the church grabbed onto, that Jesus grabbed onto to describe his followers. And so when Jesus is talking about his church, he's talking about this gathering of people who gather for a purpose or gather to do something. And so in the Bible, the Apostle Peter, he talks about this too. You've probably read this, but it says, 
You are God's chosen and special people. You're a group of royal priests and a holy nation. God's brought you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now you must tell all the wonderful things that he has done. And so we see this all throughout the New Testament when it talks about the church. It's a group of people. But you know, today, we, when we think about a church, we typically think of a, a church building, right? Or a location or a facility. And it's fine. Like, that's, that's not bad, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing to call this building a church. But the only downside to that is that it misses the point of the original meaning that the church is people. It's a group of people. It's a gathering. And this makes all the difference in the world for us. Because as you, as you, as you follow Jesus and you seek to live out your life for him, you are the church. You are. The church is not primarily a building. It's primarily a people. And any time we move away from that understanding of the church, man, we begin to lose our identity. We lose our life, our energy, our passion because we become something else. When we start to think about the church as a building, as a facility or, or, or location, it starts to become it's like it's, be it's becoming this third person or a third party, this something that's something else, right? It's, I become disconnected from it. It's like I'm saying I have me and there's God and then there's, there's church over here, this third party that gets involved and I can kind of take it or leave it. But that's not the biblical picture of the church. No, it's you and I are the church. I have me and I have God and... I'm the church. I'm part of the church. Man, that's a vastly different mindset. And so if you're following Jesus, the Bible teaches us that church is not this third party over here that sometimes helps you in your relationship with God or sometimes gets in the way of your whatever. No, no, no. We are the church. It's us. The church is you. And that, there's an extremely helpful picture that I want us to look at this morning that I just recently saw that really, I felt like, cleared a lot of this up. And so I want to share it with you this morning. Um, and hopefully it'll, it'll help you too. But basically, the church, we're one people, right? We're, we're, we're gathering together. We're one people. We're one church. But we can express ourselves in, in two ways. Well, there's two different forms. I guess you could say we're the gathered church like we are this morning. We're all gathered in. But then there's the scattered church, the Monday through Saturday church. And so we'll start there. We'll start with the church that's gathered. Oh, boy. Um, Al, would you grab me another marker from the back? It pays to check your marker before you get up here. So we'll start with the gathered church, right? But this is the easy place to start because we're gathered this morning. This is kind of that picture. We're following Jesus. We're a group. We're an assembly. Thank you, brother. Looking sharp today, too. Um, but we gather together once a week for worship. I mean, this has been the pattern of the church for, you know, 2,000 years, right? This is not new. Um, but this is the closest thing to church as a location, right? Because we have to gather... We're the gathered here, but we have to gather somewhere, right? We have to gather in some location, but, it, but really the location doesn't matter, right? Because it's who that's gathering that makes the difference, that makes up the church. Some of you, have, how many of you heard of the, the Purpose Driven Life book? Many of you have heard of that. Pastor Rick Warren wrote that book. He also started the church, Saddleback in California, that kind of spurred all of that. Well, when they started Saddleback years ago, they, were, they grew to 10,000 people before they ever bought their first building. And it's because their church was the people. It didn't matter what the facility was. They rented facilities all over Southern California. This church should know it better than any other church because you guys used to meet in school. Actually, I've done it several times, right? And that's when the church was the people. But we're the gathered church once a week. But before we gather, though, we're also scattered, right? I mean, we're all over the place. I mean, there's some of us are in North Charlotte. Some of us live in Concord. Some of us are in Harrisburg. Some of you are in South or Central Charlotte. I mean, you're all over the place, right? I mean, we're just, we're scattered. 
all over the place, Monday through Saturday, and then we come together on Sunday, and we gather. We gather for worship, we gather for Bible study, uh, you know, whatever it is that we, we're gathering for. Um, according to our latest counts, I checked with Roberta and Hannah, and, you know, depending on how we count, there's about 45 to 50 families or 45 to 50 different places all around these two counties where our church is scattered. And so today as you leave, you may have noticed that massive map of Charlotte on the wall back there. There is a purpose for this. So when you leave today, I encourage you to take a marker, uh, preferably one that works, and, uh, and take it and just mark on the map where you live. Just, take, just draw a little U where you live on the map. And so the purpose is so that next week when we come in, you'll get to see the church scattered. You'll get to see united Monday through Saturday, where we are, where we live. Because wherever you are, listen, listen, wherever you are, the church is. Anywhere you are, the church is present and active. The church is present in your neighborhood because you are there. The church is present in your job because you're there. The church is present in your family because you are in it. Wherever the church is, you are there. Isn't that an amazing thought? That's the church scattered. So mark your place on the map. We'll take a look at that next week. You've probably heard the old saying, don't go to church, be the church, right? You've heard that. And that's what they're talking about. They're, they're talking about that church scattered. Be, we can be the church wherever we are because we are literally the church. Now, obviously, that's, that's leaving out half of the picture, right? Because we're also the gathered church, too. We do gather. But then, so we're scattered throughout the week. We gather on Sundays or, or other times. And then we scatter again, right? We go back to our homes. We go back to our jobs, to our neighborhoods, wherever we're going. That's where we go. And so we follow this weekly flow in the church. We're scattered all throughout the week. We gather in one place at least once a week for worship, prayer, Bible study, whatever it is. And then we scatter back out into the community. Now, that's kind of in parentheses, okay? And we're going to bring all this together at some point. But this is just a clear picture of what United Wesleyan is. It's not just this building. It's not just this location. It's not 2601 Rocky River Road. It's you. This is our location this morning. But man, there's 45 or 50 different United Wesleyans all over this county and the surrounding counties, which is an exciting thing to think about when you want to reach people for Jesus. So now back to that third purpose. The third thing that God calls us to do as a church in order to reach people We've talked about outreach. We've talked about discipleship. This is our third purpose, the third thing that we're supposed to do to reach people. It's just as critical as outreach and discipleship for us. And if a church does this purpose really well, watch out. Things can happen. Anything is possible if we do this well. But if a church doesn't do this well, that church is going to remain weak and tired and slow. This applies to the church as a whole and also applies to us individually. And the purpose that I'm talking about is serving. Serving. One of the things that the church is designed to do is to serve others. As a whole, as a gathering, we're designed to serve. But also individually, we were designed to serve as well. And so one of the primary ways that we see this in the church is through volunteering, right? You're familiar with this. Some of you volunteer as, as ushers or, or greeters, kids workers. Some of you volunteer to watch the babies in the nursery, which, by the way, you get a special jewel in your heavenly crown for being in the nursery. You should know that and sign up. And so um, they get a special, special heavenly reward for that. Um, some of you teach a class. Some of you run sound. Actually, just one of you runs sound. Thank you, Trent. We appreciate that. He needs some help. But uh, yeah, so some of, you run, some, some of you run the worship computer back there. Some of you volunteer in music, 
Some of you do handyman work around the church. Just as a couple weeks ago, I kept hearing this noise in the church building, and I didn't see anybody's car, and I thought, somebody's here. You know, it's kind of that creepy feeling, you know, you get when you start hearing noises and you don't know what it is. And so I looked down the hallway, and there's a light on at the end of the, at the, end of the hallway where the adults meet. And I thought, somebody's back there. And so, you know, I'm creeping down, and I look in there, and there's Jean Green changing a toilet out. That's Gene serving, serving this church. None of you ever knew that he was here messing with a toilet. Talk about the lowest of the lowest jobs, and he did it to serve each of you. That is serving, and that's what we're designed to do. So there's a gazillion roles that we can fill here at United, right, in any given church. But you, you volunteer your time, your energy to do the job, to serve the needs of others in the church. Now, this is massively important for us because the more of us that are plugged in to serving and into volunteering means that the more we can accomplish together, the more that you're contributing your time, your energy, your talents. Ephesians 4 talks about it like this. It says, Christ chose some of us to be apostles, prophets, missionaries, pastors, teachers, uh, you could keep going with this list, right? I mean, Paul's just listing out some, but you could say handymen, kids workers, you know, ushers, yard mowers, you know, whatever it is. Christ has all given us gifts. He's, all give, he's given us all gifts and talents to serve the church so that his people would learn to serve and his body would grow strong. This will continue until we are united by our faith and by our understanding of the Son of God, then we will be mature just as Christ is and we will be completely like Him. And so just from this one snapshot about serving from God's Word, we see two things happen when we serve. The first one is that the, the body of Christ, the church, is built. We're built up. We grow strong. When we serve, you're helping the body grow strong. And we can see that, right? When we all pitch in, we all contribute, the more we can accomplish together. But the second thing that happens whenever we're serving in the church that we overlook or we don't talk about as much is that not only, do, not only does the church grow, you grow. I grow when we serve. There are few things that will help you grow spiritually as well as learning to serve in the church. Or learning to serve in general. For me as your pastor, I'm not, I'm not as interested in filling in all the blanks or finding warm bodies to fill some role or task. I want you to serve because I want, because I know that you will grow as a result. I know that you will grow spiritually. I know that your faith will become deeper. And I know the church will benefit as a whole too. And so when you serve, when I serve, the church grows and you grow. So I was thinking about this this week and I was like, okay, how can we kind of break some of this down? And, and I, you can kind of see different levels of engagement and different levels of being plugged in at the church, right? And there's one level where you attend worship. You come to worship. You gather in with the rest of us to worship, to pray, to sing, to hear a message. And there is benefit in attending the worship service. There's no doubt. You benefit from from worship, from being here. But then there's another level where you, you attend worship, but then you also participate in some kind of class, some kind of small group, Bible study, whatever it is. You're, you're connecting to some kind of community or fellowship here. And so I think you benefit even more when you attend worship, but then you also connect to community and fellowship in the church through some kind of group because you're benefiting from worship and fellowship at that point, right? But then there's another level of plugging into the church, and that is you attend worship, you participate in some kind of group or class or Bible study, some kind of community fellowship thing, and then you serve. You find your place, you volunteer, fulfill some role, or take some responsibility in the church. And I think that this is where it's at. This is when your faith, your spiritual growth, your appreciation for the church, all of those begin to really take off when you serve. 
Serving makes all the difference for your experience in this church. And it's because of this. Because in order to serve, you have to make the choice to put someone else's needs in front of your own. When we serve others, we're putting their needs ahead of ours. You come to the point where you can say, I'm willing to put my needs aside to meet the needs of someone else. You don't have to do that in worship. You should, but you can get by without doing that, right? You don't have to do that in a Sunday school class. You should, but you can probably get by without doing that. But by and large, if you you decide to serve, you're making that choice to place someone else's needs before your own. And that is a critical difference. This is huge for us spiritually. Serving says, I'm willing to sacrifice for the good of someone else. Who does that sound like? Jesus. Serving does more for you and me to become more like Jesus than maybe anything else in the church. I'm I'm more and more convinced of this. Because when we serve, church is no longer about me. It's no longer about you. It's about serving others. It's about serving the mission. It's about serving the one and only thing. Serving's like that miracle grow fertilizer that you put on your tomatoes, you know, so you can get the big ones. It helps you to grow. You're benefiting from not only worshiping here, connecting to community, but then you're also serving. And to look back to our discipleship week, if our discipleship is defined as becoming more like Jesus, then if we continue to break this down and to take the implications of this for us, then we have to say our discipleship will only grow as far as we serve. Serving is sacrificing your time, your energy, your talents, your experience, and your focus to help the church fulfill that one and only mission. Plugging into serve, it's not about filling in the blanks of a volunteer schedule. It's about filling in the empty chairs in this church with people from our community who need to know Jesus. That's the difference. That is what serving is all about. That's why we serve. And if we want to reach our community, we will embrace this third purpose of serving. The church is like two different ships. And these two ships can be in the same waters, filled with people guided by captains, and yet have totally different purposes. So I want us to watch this video together that talks about and contrast these two ships. I like the co- contrast, right? I mean, even the music. You get this nice Jamaican thing going and then big dramatic battleship music. But that cruise ship is all about you and me, right? A cruise ship's designed for the passengers to re- relax and rest and to be catered to, while a battleship is different. A battleship has that clear purpose, that clear mission. There's no passengers. Everyone plays a role. Everyone has a station. And on a battleship, everyone is dependent on each other. Everybody has to be at their their station, doing their job well, in order for that battleship to be successful. And so as we look at United Wesleyan Church through this battleship lens, if United is to accomplish its mission, it's clear that we'll operate like a battleship. Have you signed on to the mission? Are you ready to sign on to the mission? In two weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to sign on, sign on to the mission of our church in very clear and specific ways. In the last week of this series, kind of be a takeaway week, we'll be offering new small groups to plug into community here. We'll also be offering ways for you to plug into serving in, in new ways, or maybe in a way that you've never done before. And so if you want to be part of helping this church reach this community, then I want you to know we need you. We need you. This is going to be a battleship, and we need all hands on deck for this time 
in this place. Being a church that's serious about reaching its community is not for the faint of heart. We need every man and woman to man their stations because the devil's been winning in this community for way too long. And he's been winning in our families way too long. It's time for us to fight back. It's time to enter the battle on our knees and manning our stations. So will you sign on to the mission with us? This is not the first time you've signed on to the mission. Excuse us, we need a new chair. This is not the first time you've signed on to this mission. I know that. A lot of this is review for all of us. This is why we have to keep coming back around to it. Because we have a tendency to drift. I feel it in me. Every day I have to say, Lord, your will be done. Are you ready to sign on to this mission? In two weeks, you'll have a chance to do that in some fresh, new ways, different ways. Or you can continue what you're doing now, which is fine too. The church is doing some great things. I don't want you to hear that. But we want to be intentional about how we move forward and how we can better reach this community and better reach those who are not here yet. Let's pray.